And so he's gone, Carlos. Uh, fabulous racing driver, very good friend. First met him in 72, so I've known him for, what, 50 years. Um, we became very good friends early on. I was just a young punk from Australia. And he was this, already he was an Argentine megastar, really, wasn't he? Um, he was just fabulous. He, when I met him, of course, it was, he was just starting at Brabham and Gordon Murray was about to produce the incredible BT42, which evolved into the, the race winning BT44B. I remember, I remember it was quite fitting, really. Um, I was walking down King's Road one Saturday early in 74 when the radio news came on and announced that Carlos had won the South African Grand Prix. I remember thinking, yes. Uh, it was just one of the best moments of my life. I say it was fitting because Kings Road actually was where, we actually spent quite a lot of time in Kings Road and Carlos loved it. He loved that part of London, Chelsea. He had a house in Abbotsbury Road with the family, rented a house uh, in those Brabham days. And he often used to spend a lot of time just hanging around, watching people. And I mean, that was, that was I guess, you know, I, I, if I think about it, that's how we gel. We, we have very similar interests, people, politics, engineering, science, um, sport, obviously. Um, he loved golf, he loved tennis, football. I never really got into his whole football thing. But of course, when the World Cup was on in 78 and he had Argentina 78 on there, it was a big deal, of course, for him. Um, but, uh, yeah, we used to spend a lot of time talking about Borg versus McEnroe, Borg versus Connors. He was a massive Bjorn Borg man. He loved Ingemar Stenmark as well, the, uh, the slalom, downhill slalom skier. He loved the way he had very little spray, if that's the right word, of the snow coming off the edge of the, the ski and very small slip angles, in other words. And he always felt that, it, that Stenmark skied the way he, Carlos, like to drive um, and, and he was he was absolutely brilliant I think it was very easy for the media to sort of analyze or write Carlos off as a driver who was really quick but very moody and had his day and on his day he was really good and of course that completely belies the reality of what his day actually meant and what it meant and I don't believe in this day thing anyway. I mean, for, I knew him well, very well. And every time he didn't have a good day, there was always a very valid reason for it. But putting that to one side, um, when he was in a car in harmony with a car and could feel the surface of the road, he was unbeatable. He was incredibly good. I often used to talk to Carlos a lot about the way he drove. And, he, and for him, it was always turning in on the brakes, crushing the sidewall of the tire a little bit, getting that spring effect at the rotation. And he said the best way he could sum it up when it was all humming for him was that he could, he, before he even turned into the corner, he could see the exit of the corner in his mind. And he knew exactly what the car was going to do and where it was going to be and how it was going to react. And that's how he described his amazing pole lap at Monaco in 78 on the Michelin tyres. He loved the Michelins when they were good because they gave him that spring effect, the radials. Um, but equally, you know, he was absolutely stunning in the BT44B, uh, particularly, obviously the South African win, but equally, I mean, Austria, 74, he was fabulous. Uh, I remember I remember talking to him after that race, and he was, he was completely in awe of Denny Holm because he loved the way Denny was able to tune his McLaren with a different compound on all four wheels, which was a, a, something that Carlos really wanted to achieve, that sort of sensitivity. And all he talked about was Denny after that race, actually. 74 Watkins Glen as well, he and Pache won two for Brabham. And Carlos, I think, was kind of mystified. Well, he wasn't mystified. He was totally thought it was in character for Bernie. But I think he was a bit disappointed that Bernie had even had left the circuit by the time they crossed the line. Brabham's first one, two in the Bernie era, the Gordon Murray era. And Bernie was already at Elmira Airport getting his flight back to London. But those were the days, you know, that's what Bernie was like and job done, get out of here. Um, and, and so I think, you know, he and, he, and, he and Bernie, Carlos and Bernie had a very interesting relationship is probably the right way to put it. Um, yeah, and, and I was on the grid. I was on the grid at Kyle Army with Carlos in 81. When, uh, when the whole business was going on about FISA, folk war, and possibly a new world championship without Ferrari and Alfa and Ligier, etc. And, um, and it was all the Cosworth teams in Kailami, but it was an incredibly competitive, difficult race, obviously. And, um, and Carlos 
called Bernie over on the grid and said, Bernie, Bernie, I look into my eye now, shake my hand, tell me this race will count for world championship points, looking at Bernie. And, and Bernie said, absolutely, and shook his hand. Carlos won the race, of course. Nelson was second. Nelson um, then won the world championship by one point from Carlos. But that was with Carlos's nine points stripped. So he would have won the championship, you know, and, and, and I think that's something that Carlos obviously never really spoke about in public. He never said I was robbed or anything like that because he wasn't that sort of guy. But I think that was something that he obviously had to take with him into the rest of his life after his Formula One career. And it was a really difficult thing, you know, that the guy running Formula One took the points away from a race that enabled that guy's driver to win the world championship. Anyway, you know, that's me saying that. Carlos would never have said that. And he probably doesn't, wouldn't really want me to say it now, but I'm saying it anyway, because to me, that was one of his best wins, actually, Kyle Army 81. And it's sad that the, the win has just been filed away as a non-championship race, which it wasn't. When Carlos won that race, it was not non-championship. I think that pole lap Monaco 78 was, was astounding. Um, and then, of course, there was... Monza 81, when he had this amazing relationship with Neil Oatley in the Williams, and they did a lot of good testing in the build up to that race. And they did the, and Carlos was qualifying lap, they took the front wing off the car, which is a big deal in those days. Okay, they had a lot of downforce, but they took the front wing off. And um, Carlos was almost flat through the Lesmos at a time when the Lesmos were much, much quicker corners than they are now. And I remember him getting out of the car. Uh, I was in the Williams pit at the time. I remember getting out of the car and looking at me and his eyes were sort of like this. And it was like, you know, I knew then that he'd, 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 that was one of his laps. And um, it was. I mean, to out-qualify as many turbo cars as he did around Monza, <laughs> unbelievable. And Neil Oatley today will say it was still one of the most astounding uh, performances he's ever seen. I think Patrick Head would agree with that. Um, Interlagos 77 is a race I really enjoyed. I spent a lot of time with Carlos that way. He loved Brazil and he loved everything about the Brazilians and their music and their nature and the climate and the heat and everything else. And um, to go out and win for Ferrari at the beginning of his Ferrari career, beating Nicky really. I mean, there was, there was a rear wing in dispute. It was a new Mauro Foggeri rear wing. Carlos tried it, liked it. Nicky tried it, didn't like it. Carlos won with it. And after that, of course, Nicky went back to Fiorano and it all changed. And then the world championship uh, took on a different complexion. Although in 77, that was a, the, the Ferrari 312 T2 was a very, very difficult car to drive um, on the good years of the time, which were much uh, stiffer. And they spent a lot of the winter developing or trying to develop a De Dion rear end on the car and also six wheel Ferrari with four at the back. Carlos did a lot of that testing. It was all a waste of time, of course. So they didn't actually do a massive amount of testing on the, on the good years that were going to be raced. And by mid-season, we're talking Swedish Grand Prix here, the car was so bad that Nicky just pulled out of the race saying it was undrivable. I refuse to drive this car anymore this weekend. And Carlos finished third in that same car. And I think that was one of his best drives ever, that Swedish Grand Prix. Well, so many moments with Carlos away from the track. I mean, he, he loved rallying. And, I, and I, he was a huge Walter Roll fan as well. Massive Walter Roll fan. And when Roll won, I'm saying it's 1981, might have been 80 rally of Portugal, massive fog. And he, and he made up, I don't know how much, three minutes in the fog compared with the rest of the field. Um, I think that the stage was called Argonaut or something like that. And anyway, he taped the word Argonaut on the steering wheel of the Williams just to make him think of Roll and how good Roll was. And that was, you know, that's how Carlos was. He was always looking at other athletes, other sportsmen, other drivers, learning, 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 and being inspired and, and, and impressed by them in so many ways. Um, and that, you know, and he was good at rallying. I mean, he started in rallying, a bit like Fangio. He started on the dirt in Fiat 1500s and he went back to, and he used to love rallying. He loved it. And he went back to rallying and he eventually, I think Jean Todd actually got him a, got him a drive at Peugeot in the uh, Côte d'Azur rally, world championship rally in Argentina after he'd retired. And he, um, he was third. He, he, he led some of the, he won some of the stages and he was third overall in the World Championship Rally. Not many Formula One drivers of this relatively recent era can say, can have that sort of versatility. 
He loved sports car racing as well. He loved driving for Ferrari. And he, I remember him saying that, you know, one of the most beautiful moments of his life was driving the 312P uh, at Le Mans and listening to the sound of the flat 12 engine and the Moussan flat out in top gear was one of the great moments of his life. He loved, he loved driving for Ferrari. He, he, he got on well with Enzo. He got on very well with Luca Montezemolo. And he, he, always had, he was fairly dispassionate about the cars. He said, very good engines, very good gearboxes, never handle. And that was, that was right. You know, he loved the, the engines and the gearboxes in the Ferraris. One of Carlos's most spectacular wins was Brands Hatch, 78. He always wanted to win the British Grand Prix. For him, it felt like, well, it felt like Wimbledon. For a tennis player, I think, he, he just had this thing about the British Grand Prix and Monaco as well, of course, which he won in 80. Uh, Brands, he went to Brands that year uh, feeling very pressured already by Ferrari, who were making noises in the Italian press, auto sprint. Corriere della Sera, etc., uh, that Schechter was going to be joining the team in 79. So Carlos was unsettled by that and was a bit aloof from the team all weekend. And it wasn't as if he had a point to prove because he'd been really quick. And, and any races that he hadn't won had almost, in every case, either been a Mario Andretti ground effect victory and or a Michelin drama at Ferrari. So there wasn't a lot. Carlos could do about either of those two factors uh, and he stayed as ever at the we st he stayed at the Capitol Hotel and I drove him to and from the track every day in my Alfa I had at the time and I remember on race day we got there quite early he loved to get to the track very early on race day particularly but not to get into the paddock and be with the team he'd get there and then he said oh let's go for a drive and we drove out somewhere into the Kent countryside and he got out of the car and then he jo went jogging for about 25 minutes. Anyway, he won that race and he won that race because A, he, he was really quick and loved brands and never gave up, obviously. And secondly, because they came up to lap, he was catching Nicky Lauda in the Brabham Alpha. They came up to lap Bruno Giacomelli, uh, who was in a McLaren. And this would never happen today because we have too much GPS, we have too many instructions to slower cars to get out of the way and, and using the back markers is no longer part of the skill as it was for Sterling Moss, for example, when he won the 61 Monaco Grand Prix or when James Hunt won in Canada using the back markers um, brilliantly. And Carlos did the same thing. He, he just saw where Nicky was placing the Brabham, saw a gap, went down uh, between the road and Bruno and got the lead at uh, Clearways. Absolutely fabulous move. And then that was it, just won the race. And he, he loved, I mean, that podium, I think, meant more to him, as much for Carlos as any we've seen. Uh, certainly, it was an amazing moment, given the build-up to the race and the dramas at Ferrari. And equally, uh, I spent about three or four months afterwards with the very accommodating Neil Easton Gibson of the RAC trying to get for Carlos a very good replica of the trophy because of course it's a challenger trophy the British Grand Prix trophy and you have to hand it back after a year. Carlos loved that trophy and wanted to have this replica which eventually we got with Neil's help and um, that for sure is in Santa Fe now. Yeah we had so many golden moments obviously very difficult to go through them in a short video um, but yeah, Long Beach 76 was so much fun. We, it was the first time Formula One had gone to California and it was just, none of us had ever been there before. Carlos hadn't been there. We were all just completely besotted with the place. But whereas most of the Formula One crowd were all Beverly Hillsing and going out and partying, all Carlos wanted to do was look for tools. Tools, I need tools for my farm. Uh, the tools in America are the best tools. And so we spent two days, you know, away, away from the track, um, looking at tools. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, he loved it when Frank got sponsorship, Frank Williams from Leyland Tractors, because that enabled him to go to a few agricultural shows, which he enjoyed immensely. And, and we'd go testing at Snetterton when he was at Lotus. And he'd spend half the day looking across at the fields on the other side, wondering what sort of uh, fertilizer they were using on the corn as he called it. And, you know, we'd talk endlessly about Jack Nicklaus and about um, 
George Shultz and whether or not the price of gold would go up or down. Uh, Shultz was, I think, Secretary of State of America at the time. And um, he had a very good feel for politics. He had a very good feel for commerce. I mean, he was buying TV rights for the Argentine Grand Prix and selling them to networks long before Bernie was into it. In fact, it was, it, was Bern, it was Carlos and Emerson doing that that got Bernie all fired up about TV rights. So Carlos was right at the front of that as well. And he was a very good negotiator. You know, he did really well at, at Ferrari with sponsors and he had a million different sponsors, all of them really good. All of them believed 100% in Lole and Carlos and the whole purity of his driving and his racing. And at the, when Frank persuaded him to come back in 82, um, he did, and he did two races. He did South Africa, which he finished second, really good drive, and then had a shunt in Brazil, and that was it. Nothing to do with the Falklands War. He just kind of had enough of the whole thing, and anyway, he just had enough. And, and he had some politics that he wanted to try and... and he, yeah, he had a need to go back to Argentina and do and surf and Santa Fe province, which he did wonderfully well. But he got, but I remember him negotiating with Frank on that 82 deal and, and you know, Carlos wanted X amount and Frank only had Y. And uh, in the end, he, Carlos rang and he said, look, just tell Frank that I drive for nothing. No problem at all. I love the racing. I drive for nothing on one condition. I said, no, what's that, Carlos? And he said, I drive on the condition that Patrick and Frank also pay themselves nothing. <laughs> so I rang Frank, told him, and of course, um, you know, Frank immediately agreed to Carlos's exorbitant fees. He got on very well with John Hogan too. He loved John Hogan and Marlborough, and um, he loved, you know, talking to Hoagie about a million different things. Uh, and 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 he, you know, I think he got on well with. I mean, Nicky, he was always a bit mystified by Nicky. Um, you know, when Nicky broke his rib, he was a bit shocked by that, you know, driving the car. And then when Nicky just suddenly walked out of the Ferrari team in 77 in Canada, he was pretty um, taken aback by that. But he loved Jill. And, and, and I think Jill was the, the, the best teammate he ever had in terms of a friendship and really feeling fond of another driver. Although I don't think he ever had a problem with Alan either. He really respected Alan Jones at Williams. Obviously, there was a moment when Carlos became a racer at Williams and there was a certain misunderstanding about everything. I, I think Carlos, at the end of the 81 Long Beach Grand Prix, got out of the car and said, you know, that's it, all bets are off now. I'm not going to help Alan anymore. I'm not quite sure what happened. Something happened on the track. And then, of course, the next race was Brazil, and that was the famous um, jones Wright pit board, which Carlos never got to see. <laughs> that was it. And he won that race. And uh, as I say, you know, I think he should have won the championship that year, but he didn't um, for a number of reasons. But the main one was that he lost nine points from South Africa. Um, yeah, you know, he's been fighting an illness for a long time. I think it would have, you know, it would have hit a younger person a lot sooner than it's finally... Um, hit Carlos and in a way it's a blessing because he it, he was very ill and that's you know I don't want to go too far down that road but I just for me Carlos uh, and, and, and I should men mention here his family and friends all of whom were always wonderful I had some amazing times with all of them I think about him, Richard Wilmot, um, Oscar da Rosa, Candiotti you know so many good guys, Jose Maria Candiotti, and we just had so much fun, barbecues and stuff in Santa Fe in Argentina, and after the race, before the race, all the journalists, Herman Sopena, who I really miss, who we lost as well, very good Argentine journalist. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know, lots of wonderful times with his family as well, Cora, Mariana, and Mimicha, and Veronica. Um, anyway, all I can say is that he's a friend and a phenomenal Grand Prix driver, racing driver, from whom I learned a massive amount, which I'll always be grateful for. He was very helpful to me in a number of ways. And for me, Carlos, you know, people like Carlos, you know, they, they'll never go. He's always there. And um, thanks for everything.